Welcome everyone to BizHack Live. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the C CEO and founder of BizHack Academy. BizHack Live is a weekly live webinar series with some of the top minds in marketing. And today we have a special treat. I want to welcome Ed Delia of Delia Associates, a second generation B2B branding expert. And he's here to talk about how your B2B brand can accelerate its growth with good brand storytelling, one of my favorite topics. Great to have you here today, Ed. Great to be here. I wanted to welcome our part, uh, thank our partners who uh, have helped uh, promote this and make BizHack Live. Uh, we're now nearing our 50th webinar and entering, and we're in season three. Uh, the American Marketing Association, South Florida chapter, the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association and Miami Marketers as well as CIC, which is a co-working space and creation station, uh, which is in Fort Lauderdale, uh, associated with the library. I also wanted to announce an exciting new partnership with the Idea Center at Miami-Dade College. Next week, I'm going to be on stage talking about my favorite topic, which is business storytelling, how to tell your business story, and how that fits into your larger lead generation strategy, what we call the LBS or lead building system that we've developed working over seven years with 700 businesses. It's definitely not to be missed. Look forward to seeing you guys here, 1230 for the LBS webinar, uh, and I'll be the presenter. I did want to encourage you guys, please ask questions. This is a live interactive session, so you make it what you will. There's a little Q&A at the bottom where you can ask your questions. Uh, we will share these slides that Ed is going to be showing, so don't feel like you have to take notes, be present, uh, don't multitask, and we will also share a recording on the BizHack Live YouTube channel. So really would encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A um, and introduce yourselves in the chat. Without further ado, I wanted to introduce today's special guest, Ed Delia, the president of Delia Associates a marketing agency focused on B2B brand building, founded by his father, Michael, in 1964 and taken over by Ed uh, more than two and a half decades later in 1998. And they have developed their own proprietary brand development system called the Brand Leadership Solution. And I'm really excited to hear, Ed, about how you've sort of systematized the building of a brand. Uh, this is something I'm very eager to learn from you and really important uh, if you're running an agency to create systems that your clients can use that are proven, that have a track record of success. This is a patented process that debuted nearly 20 uh, years ago and the brand leadership solution has been proven with more than 200 uh, B2B brands to help them launch, revitalize and grow. So without further ado, Ed Delia of Delia Associates. It's great to have you here today. Thanks so much, Dan. It's great to be here. And thank you, Lilia, for all your help too. Uh, okay, let me um, let me pull up my screen here. You should see on the bottom of your screen, a uh, share screen option. Then you can click on that and select it. Yeah, everything just minimized on me though, unfortunately. <clears throat> no worries. While you're working on that, um, Welcome everybody, great to have you here. If you have any questions that you wanna put in, there's a little Q&A button about B2B branding. Um, obviously some of the questions will come as Elia's, uh, as Ed's presentation goes, uh, but it's great to see you, Amber and Andre. Uh, you have always great questions. Armando Anderson, full of great questions. Bia, C Ketchup, Darren, nice to see you. Frida, Jacqueline, Lois, McKenna. Uh, McKenna's working with us now as an intern, great to have you here. Pam Stein, one of my mentors, is here, which is very honored to have you, uh, Raheem, and, and Ross Can from A4 Architects. So it's great to have you guys. We have a great group for you, Ed. Um, <clears throat> um, are you seeing my screen now? <laughs> Excuse me. Are you yes, seeing sir. my... Yep, we see a lot. It looks perfect. Okay, good deal. Great. Okay. Um, sorry, a little, little technical difficulty. We should all be accustomed to that uh, in, the, in the era of, of COVID, though, by now. No so, worries. Um, so as I said, um, I prepared a presentation, but I'm, I'm cool to go off script. So if there's any questions, um, people can fire away at any time. And as Dan mentioned, uh, we're going to make everything available to you um, post this presentation so you can go back um, to, to be, uh, you know, fully transparent. I, I tend to show a lot of slides when I present. So if I go fast and you need me to go back over something, just throw your hand up and I'll 
I'll circle back. So as I was um, getting ready for this talk, I was uh, reflecting back on my childhood. Uh, I used to go out hunting with my grandfather. And I was too young to hunt, so I would just accompany him. And I think partly just grandma would send me just so that grandpa would come home okay. So my grandfather was from Italy, so he had a very thick Italian accent. And we'd be walking through the woods, and then suddenly, boom, he would take a shot. And he, he used to hunt with this, this massive 10-gauge shotgun, and it just, the echo effect, it sounded like a cannon. And he would just fire off a shot, and he'd go, hey, kid, kid, he'd call me kid, kid, go see, which means I should, I should go in the brush and see what the heck grandpa just shot. It could have been an animal. It could have been somebody's pet. We don't know. He prescribed to the fire ready aim approach to hunting. And needless to say, grandpa was not a very good hunter uh, and probably brought home more deer uh, by virtue of hitting them with his truck than he did uh, at the end of a shotgun. My, my brother, on the other hand, was an excellent shot. And my brother prescribed more to the ready aim fire approach. And he took very few shots. But when he did, he was highly successful because he, he got ready, he took aim, and then he fired. And as marketers, that's really where we want to be. We don't want to just take shots into the bush, right? We want to be ready, we want to take aim, and we want to fire in a very deliberate way. Because even if we don't fully hit the mark, we're probably going to be far more successful than taking what we call in marketing a hip shot. So <clears throat> just kind of to, to, to set the context of the day, um, I know, I know the talk is about accelerating growth with brand power, but I'm going to also um, refer to a, an expression I learned many years ago from one of our first Norwegian clients. And um, as the CEO signed on with our program, he said, your, your system reminds me of a, of a, a popular Norwegian expression, which is hurry slowly. So hurry slowly means, yes, we're going to move at a good pace, but we're going to hurry slowly. That means we're going to be very deliberate and very conscious of where we're moving. So I invite you again as marketers, as we go through today's talk, yes, we want to get out to tactics and yes, we want to get out to engagement with the marketplace, but we want to hurry slowly and make sure we're doing so on a journey and on a path that's, that makes sense and that's going to produce results at the end. Because if we hurry slowly and we do our ready and aim, when we fire, we're going to have much more success. Okay. <clears throat> so accelerating growth, we're going to be talking about brand power. And a few um, best facts about, uh, and, and Dan touched on a lot of this, um, Delia Associates has been around since 1964. We're based in White House, New Jersey. I'm a second generation, so I bought the business from my father, Mike Delia. Right now we have 14 humans, and on certain days you could see a little Bichon named Jeter running around the office. So that's our, our, our mascot. Um, our expertise is B2B branding. So if you happen to be representing a consumer brand, I'm not saying that, that none of this content will be relevant. I'm just saying that our expertise is B2B branding, and that's really where we focus. Our longest client relationship is 30 years, and our top 10 average is 10.8 years. And across the last 27 months, uh, we've won 37 awards, both um, national and global for B2B brand uh, development. And that's not a um, me bragging, that's me maybe bragging about my team. I've got a great team, and I really can't take the credit for that. I really have to give them the credit. They're, they're fabulous, and they do remarkable work. Some fun facts about me. Um, I'm married to Lori, um, my wife, who is also our VP and general counsel. So we're a husband-wife team. So she works in the business with me. We have twins, and that's why we became a husband-wife team. So she joined us about 16 years ago. The twins are 16, and uh, we sat down one day, and she said, I'm a, I'm a part-time mom and a part-time litigator, and I'm not happy in either camp. So I said, well, why don't you come into Delia Associates, and we'll, we'll work on this together. And, and, uh, and that's how it's gone. Uh, one of my favorite places in the world is Cooperstown. So I have a I love uh, for, for baseball, and you might see um, uh, remnants of, of the diamond in our logo is not by, by chance. It's about precision and the precision of the creative process and also a bit of a nod to baseball. Uh, in the last uh, two years, I've lost 84 pounds, so you're seeing a, a lesser version of me. And when I'm not uh, building B2B brands, uh, you might find me fishing or snowboarding. Um, I went to Dickinson College, and I hold a uh, professional certified marketer uh, designation, which actually is from the American Marketing Association. So. So today, this is what we're going to be covering. Understanding brands, so I want to give you a little bit of context, planning for success, that's a little bit of strategy, and then we're going to end with marketing to growth ideas, which is more about tactics. Everybody good so far? Make it sense? Good. So what I hope that you get okay, from this is... Um, I'm a, I'm a rather pragmatic marketer, um, so I'm not the guy that's going to give you the whiz-bang killer idea per se, 
Uh, however, what I hope to do today is connect some dots for you, maybe create some affirmations of things that you thought to be true or believed to be true, and, and also hopefully come away with some new learning. And if you do have that aha moment, I'm delighted. So I, I hope you do. So, you know, Ed, I wanted to pause just for a second because I loved that introduction. And what I loved about it was how human it was. You. Um, and, you know, you talked about family, you talked about your passion for baseball, you talked about losing weight and how proud of you, uh, proud of that you are. You talked about your team. Um, and I just, I, it's beautiful. Uh, you, you really have a, 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 a you're, you're really showing that B2B brands uh, are really about human to human. And that if you can connect one human to another, you can create long lasting relationships. You know, it's an extraordinary thing, guys, for an agency to have decade long relationships with clients. Uh, and so I just wanted to take a, a quick point and just say that that is the way you introduce yourself. Congratulations. Oh, thank, thank you. For you. That. Thank you. And you raise an excellent point. Uh, we often say that the, um, the true B2B is P2P. It's person to person because ultimately uh, most B2B engagements come down to two people making some decisions about whether or not to move forward on an initiative. So exactly. You're not selling into a, you're not selling to a company. You're selling to people inside of a company. Yep. And we are going to touch on uh, building a brand persona along, along the way. So, so uh, um, thanks for teeing that up then. So <clears throat> I thought it would be helpful. Um, speaking of, um, there's a lot of, a lot of terminology and people think about and speak about brands um, in a variety of ways. In fact, we just did a, a proprietary research study um, targeting VPs of sales and marketing. And it was very um, illuminating in terms of how, um, diverse people's understanding of even the terminology around brand uh, actually are. So I wanted to give you some, some definitions that uh, to, to, to again, frame out the context of what we're talking about today. And when people ask me what a brand is, and there's many ways to define that, the easiest way that I define it is a brand is unique times three. It's a unique entity with a unique offering for a unique audience. So unique times three. And unique, of course, means it's unlike anything else. So this seems like a very simple statement, but if you really dwell on that and think about your brand and think, how are we a unique entity? How are we offering something to the marketplace that's unique? How can we categorize our audience as unique? You're really well on your way to defining a great brand. And I wanted to give as an example, and along the way today, gang, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some examples of, of, of clients just to illustrate some points. So this is a client, um, THEM, they are a packaging um, machinery distributor and a contract packager. And you could probably guess what kinds of packaging they, they work in. Stick packs, right? So they saw an opportunity in North America to be the leader in stick packs. That was their focus, their, their unique offering, stick packs. Their unique um, uh, audience was brand owners of CPGs that um, were looking to extend their lines or to grow their business or grow their brands using new packaging. And the stick pack authority was established and that company went from, I think when we started with them, they were about a seven or $8 million company. Uh, today they're, they're, they're encroaching uh, 50 million. Now, obviously their portfolio has gone beyond stick packs, but that's really the catalyst of their growth. So they were a unique entity with a unique offering for a unique audience and lo and behold, massive growth uh, would follow. So when you narrow that focus, you broaden your appeal. Um, so we understand that branding is unique times three, or brand is unique times three. Branding then is how we apply that uniqueness across all relevant touch points. And these are just a few of the touch points that a brand can engage in. But thinking, thinking about it this way, every time we put our brand out there, every interaction, whether person to person or virtual or some other means is an opportunity to deliver a positive and in fact, impactful brand expression. So that's really what branding is, is delivering that uniqueness with consistency, across all touch points. Um, ride, RideWise here is the, um, the carpool and ride sharing solution in Somerset County. Um, they were had a very old and tired brand. So we re revitalized their brand with the little map insignia and that became signature for RideWise. Let's go was their message. Used consistently in print, digital, out of home in presentation to drive that point home. That That's RideWise and they're all about getting people from where, where they need to go, in, at least in Somerset County. So <clears throat> we also get asked sometimes, 
marketing and sales. What's the difference? Where does one begin? Where does one end? Um, Dan, I'm sure you, you you speak to this topic probably a lot in your in your talks too. Um, we see marketing as all the actions that a, uh, a brands take to start or strengthen a prosperous relationship. And then sales are the actions that um, a brand ambassador might take to convert that relationship into a new or repeat client. So that's that's really how, so so really as a, as a, as a brand owner, um, if you're ever faced with a question of, hey, do we pursue this marketing tactic? A great question to ask is, well, how will, how will it start or strengthen a prosperous relationship? And if you don't like the answer, it doesn't mean it's a bad tactic. It just means you haven't honed in on it. You haven't, you know, taken your aim well enough yet. You know, you're, you're getting close, too close to firing and you haven't aimed yet. So go back and think again. And how will it start or enhance a buying relationship? And that's a great guide for any sort of new tactic that you might be anticipating or thinking about. So we often use the horse to water analogy to all this to bring them all together. So think of marketing as the, the force that compels the horse towards the water. Sales is the force that compels the horse to drink. Brand is if there's more than one well, how the horse decides which well to drink. And branding is how each well makes itself look more attractive than the other to the horse in question. So if the horse is a thoroughbred, he might go for the Evian well. If it's uh, more of a fun horse, it might go to the uh, store brand well, or if it's somewhere in between, they might go for pull and spring, right? So there's different choices in the marketplace and different brands for that horse to choose from. And, and brands and branding is how that horse decides which one is the, the brand of choice for me. When we talk about brand development, and that's largely the business we're in, we're, that's really the purposeful creation of distinct brand positioning, messaging, and style to engage ideal audiences, both on an emotional and functional level. And that's important, emotional and functional. I was just actually having a conversation with, um, with a prospect this morning. And right away I knew that the marketing was done in Europe. And I could tell because Europeans tend to have a much more emotive style. Now this was a very industrial product. Yet if you looked at the website, you'd think that they were selling um, perfume. I mean, the, the website had flowers and children running around a tree and no indications of what the product was. And it was a B2B industrial product, um, but that's a very European style. They tend to go more to the, to the emotional side of the, the equation. In North America, we tend to be more balanced where we're looking for both emotion to lead, but function to follow closely behind. And this, um, this is our process, the one that Dan um, referenced before, the brand leadership solution discover, define, differentiate, deploy. And I'm just sharing this with you because this is gonna be used as something of the context and cadence for which we're gonna talk about some of the components of our process. And I'm gonna give you some good takeaways along the way for things to think about exercises you can do using our process on your own to start to think about your brand and get to that ready, aim, fire position and hurry slowly and get there quickly. So we often say branding without brand development is kind of like building a house without the, the, the blueprints and the foundation. It's not gonna go so well. So if you've ever had a tactical execution that didn't go so well, it may have something to do with your strategy and it may very well have something to do with your brand and how your brand was positioned. Uh, and it may not necessarily be the tactic at all. So always good to have that strong foundation. So making sense so far, any questions? Everybody's good? Okay. My, my only question is that, was that a real picture? The, the one of the, that building? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, you really do need a solid foundation. You know, at, at BizHack, we call it the business story. Uh, you call it the brand. We mean the same thing though. Okay, okay, cool, cool. So in terms of some of the components of brand, and I thought it would be helpful to just look at the construction. And I, and I just took a client, uh, Ford a Corporation. They manufacture um, concrete fiber that's used to reinforce concrete flooring to make it stronger and also to last longer. Uh, so less repair, less maintenance using their fiber. And it's really remarkable. There's these little tiny synthetic pieces of coiled fiber that when they're mixed with the concrete, actually um, studies have proven that it actually enhances the strength of the floor and the, the, the durability and longevity of, of the floor. Uh, so a lot of their clients would be um, like, a, um, like a factory or a warehouse or a manufacturing floor, like a large, large square footage of flooring uh, would be uh, people that would um, use, um, use Ford as uh, materials in their, in, their, in their flooring product. 
So these are the components um, that I'm going to take you through, and I'm just going to take you through in an orderly fashion. So this is Ford's logo mark. So the um, uh, and 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 the, um, the 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 way in which the type was set up, we went with kind of a chunkier style because it is a construction category, and the mark has meaning. The mark is actually a bird's eye overhead of a cross section of one of their fibers because they're coiled up. And if you did a, a bird's eye in one of their little pieces of fiber, it would look kind of like this, like little coils and circles. So that represents obviously the fibers, but we said, you know what? We can extrapolate meaning there too. It also represents the people and these become their circles of strength. And so what we're looking for is an opportunity to have some ownable brand value out of the mark itself. And we say these circles stand for leadership, the people, working in partnership with supportive products and service, driving innovation to deliver excellent products. And that became Ford's circles of strength. And that's very much tied to their core values and who they are as an organization. So we've really embedded a lot of brand value in a seemingly simple mark. That mark has tremendous meaning both around the product and around the people. The descriptor then is concrete fiber. So a descriptor often lives with a logo to be the most um, functional definition of what the brand does or, or how the brand serves. Um, this is important because if I didn't put the word concrete fiber, fiber under Forda, Forda could mean anything. Um, we have a longstanding client, Meyer and Depew. Well, my, well, they used to just show their logo, Meyer and Depew. Meyer and Depew could mean anything. That could be a law firm, that could be an accounting firm. Meyer and Depew is actually a heating and cooling company. So we said, hey, how about Meyer and Depew heating and cooling? And they said, yeah, okay, that makes sense because now people know what they are. Um, so it's always important a descriptor provides context for your audience. And usually the descriptor and the logo live together. The brand statement is the customer focused call to action, often external and internal. In the case of Forda, the message was stronger lasting. And across all their divisions and all their products, they're all designed to be stronger and longer lasting. So it was a little bit play on longer lasting and stronger. So stronger lasting became their message. And in our analysis, um, uh, we, we looked at the origins of the word Forda. Well, the word Forda comes from a, is a German derivation of Forte and Forte means strength in German. So um, great alignment there in terms of the mark as well. As far as visual assets, in addition to showing the fibers, we wanted to show large flooring projects that they worked on. We wanted to show people in partnership, and we also wanted to show um, the test of time. So, and this is how the brand messaging played out. And brand messaging is designed to support the brand statement and enunciate some of the key aspects of the brand. So it's designed to stand the test of time. Our innovative products do the same for the stronger lasting. Of all the bonds we form, none is more important, stronger lasting meaning stronger lasting partnerships with our clients, many dating back for, for decades. And then finally, unfortunately, we weren't around when it was built. That was a little bit of a playful one. Uh, if, if they had been around for the Coliseum, the Coliseum would still be in one, one piece. Um, also important to note that the leadership team is, uh, they work hard, but they also play hard. So they are a bit of a playful bunch. So this resonated with them. So the identity system then are all of the visual rules and components of the brand. Um, this brand did have a global footprint, so we did see a need for a visual standards guide. So laying down the colors and color consistency is very important. Um, people respond to color far more than they do to a, a black and white composition. And the rationale for having a, a logo mark or a glyph in a logo is because people um, will, will see visuals and process visuals at, at a rate of, I think, 60,000 times faster than just text. So if you're ever wondering, gosh, do I have a, an insignia in my, my mark? Yes, if you want it to be seen um, stronger, faster, better. And this was their um, stationary system. Again, highlighting their, their signature mark, um, email signature, apparel, hard hat, of course, signage, and then literature. Again, all consistent, all using that um, red, black, and gray uh, palette with a lot of consistency and a lot of impact and across presentation wear. So you could see everything is tying together as well as on the web, of course, too. And then in trade show, and this was the booth where they debuted the new brand at World of Concrete. And World of Concrete has some massive, massive booths and massive equipment. Um, it's the Concrete Industries largest show. They did not have the largest booth, but because we used red, 
which was a rather differentiating co color in the category, you could see their booth from almost anywhere on the floor. And when I talked to the CEO towards the end of the show, he said, we've probably had double the amount of leads by virtue of just having the red and the banner high and people seeing us and seeing our name. So a little bit on the construction, and that's a good best practice in terms of how you should set up your brand from a, from a visual and, and, um, and an architectural standpoint. So why do we care about all this? Why does this matter? Well, a couple of stats for you. For brands that lead with emotion, buyers are largely highly likely to have a positive image with 89%, trust in 86%, and be loyal to at 83%. And that was an Omnicom study done not long ago. When it comes to consistency, um, another study indicated that consistent presentation of a brand has proven to increase overall revenue by 33%. Now, some studies have had that number at 27, but still, that's a good number, 27 to 33% increase just by being consistent. And then finally, um, in a McKinsey study, B2B companies with strong brands have outperformed weak ones by over 20%. So again, by virtue of having a strong brand, you immediately elevate yourself and elevate yourself beyond your competition. And in a study we just finished, we found that 90% of the sales and marketing execs that we, we surveyed saw a brand image of high importance to growing near-term sales. Interestingly, in the same study, there, they indicated about 18% had a strong command of brand, um, which, which tells me that's a, that's a pretty big delta from 90 to 18%, um, but, uh, but they all saw the importance. They don't know how to do it, but they saw the importance. So um, maybe we are barking up the right tree, I guess. I don't know. So a little bit about um, context, a little bit about why brands are important and a little bit of structure. Uh, any questions yet before I keep going? So far, no questions, although I do invite folks to throw things into the Q&A. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll definitely let you know if there are any questions. But okay, it's a good. really clear and, and, and really be beautiful work with the, with the construction company. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we've got some context and we're ready. Let's take some aim. Let's, let's talk about discovery. So we start the discovery process with what we call the ideal client. And, and Dan, you may have different vernacular for this too, um, but we use... Um, the ABCs of defining the ideal client. A stands for awesome, B stands for bipolar, and C stands for, for corrosive. So starting with C, a C client is one that we probably should not have taken on. They just don't match up well with our business. Doesn't mean they're bad people or we're bad people, it just means there wasn't a good fit. And the relationship either didn't go very well or didn't go at all, right? So they were a C. Um, and usually, Dan, I'm the only dummy in the room that puts up their hand and says, yeah, I've, I've, I've picked up some C clients in my day. You know, most people are far smarter than me than to do that. But I, I've done it. Um, you know, I have a, I have a line, which is uh, I like to ask people, what was the first time you fired a client? And it's one of the most important moments in the life of almost any business owner. And the, fi the clients you're firing are clearly the corrosive ones. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 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 and, and I think, you know, fire is always a strong word. So, so I think of it as, uh, you know, maybe politely parting ways um, is uh, um, because I, I can honestly say that there's a client that I politely parted ways with and they came back and we ended up having the most delightful relationship I could ever dream of with a client because we politely parted ways. Um, and believe me, Dan, I wanted to part ways in a far less than polite way. <laughs> So um, that was my wife, Lori, saying this is a time to show some restraint and stay professional and stay true to your values of professionalism. So um, so C clients, yeah, we, we really, we don't want to build our brand around those. We also don't really want to build our brand around what I call B or bipolar. Um, and I can, I can make fun of bipolar because I'm a little bipolar. I think everybody in my industry is a little bipolar, so it's okay. Um, B means that we, we never really know where we stand. So uh, I can distinctly think of a client that was a B client because I honestly would go to their office for a meeting and I'm like, I don't know if he's going to fire me or hug me. And depending on the day, you'd either get, you know, hugged or not hugged. And it was, um, you never know your footing. You never know where you stand with them, no matter what you do. And they can be very frustrating, but they're a B level client because they're, they're not great, they're, but they're not corrosive. They're just, they're in the middle. 
A stands um, for. And before, before we do have a question about the C corrosive clients, which is um, how quickly can one recognize that they have a C client, which I think is a great question. Just how do you know? Well, hopefully they're showing signs in the, um, in the prospecting phase. So I'll give you an example. Um, I will usually not take on a prospect if in the first meeting I discover that they've been through four or five other agencies in the last four or five years. You know, or, I, or I'll, I'll straight out ask them, like, what happened in that relationship? Because those relationships are two-way streets. So what happened and why do you think the relationship with us is going to be successful? Because if, if they keep having problems, that means they're, they're probably not going to be happy with any sort of outsourced provider. And it probably means they should be insourcing the discipline because they're not happy with anybody on the outside. And after four or five attempts, if you're still not happy, there's something not right there. Um, so a lot of times you can snuff that out in the prospecting process. Um, another you know, clear cut sign is if they do, if you do onboard the client, um, you'll often hear, hey, it's our smallest client, but they're our biggest headache. So they've always got problems. They've always got issues. They're the ones that call you know, either 5.05 on a Friday or you know, even better yet, Saturday morning, wanting immediate answers, right? Um, when they know you're not a business that operates, you know, 24-7, 365. Uh, those, those don't seem like real good relationships or if they're um, nasty or abusive to you or your people, um, those usually are, are walk away um, relationships. And as I say, you know, fire is a strong word, but if you pleasantly exit or pleasantly part ways, you know, everybody's fine, it's okay. Um, so A is the kind we want. A is the love affair. A-level A clients are the ones that we, we love working with them as much as they love working with us. They're the ones when they do call, you're happy that they call. And if they happen to call on the Saturday, you probably don't even mind because you love them so much. And, and if they're calling, they, they probably have a real emergency and they need your help. And it's legit. Those are the ones we want. And there, there is a bit of a code to what they look like. So an A-level client will typically, and they don't have to be your largest client, but by virtue of the relationship, they'll probably become one of your larger clients because they'll probably grow. Because if you like them and they like you, it stands to reason you're going to do more with them. So they may not start out as your largest, but they might end up being one of your largest. They use you the way you're supposed to be used. They show appreciation for what you do for them. They improve the way you do business. You actually think creatively and innovatively about how you serve them and what you can do with them. And, and those innovative solutions could be applied to other clients potentially. They're, they're, they're willing to, to pay and pay on time and reward you for your efforts. And they're also happy to tell others about the positive experience of using you. And it's important um, to note that um, it's perfectly okay to approach an A-level client and say, hey, we love working with you. We, we love people working with people just like you. And if you have any colleagues that you think would benefit from an introduction, we're always grateful for that too. Um, good line of conversation with an A-level. Uh, I would not have that line of conversation with a B or C-level client. Uh, because clients tend to refer uh, to peer or slightly down. So if you go to a C-level and say, ask for a referral, they're going to give you another C-level <laughs> and you don't want that. Or a B-level will give you another bipolar client. You don't necessarily want that. But A-level, yeah, they're going to they're gonna lead you to other great, great clients. And they always do. So there's tremendous value in understanding who your A's are. And, and a great exercise is to, to just do an A, B, and C on a piece of paper draw lines down, and actually write down the names of your A-level relationships that are that love affair, and then the B-levels and then the C-levels. Um, we did this exercise with an IT company, um, very successful IT company, good size. They were growing. And when we did this exercise, the two managing partners kind of had a bit of a white-looking expression on their face. I'm like, what's wrong, guys? They're like, we did this exercise. We only put two clients in the A category. Okay, it's good to acknowledge, but that's okay. That means that the way your business is set up right now, there's only two ideals and we need to get more ideal clients. So we need to look at how we're supporting the Bs and Cs and really think about what we're doing differently with these A-level clients and how to find more of those. So it's okay if you don't have a ton of As or what you would classify as As, 
The point is, let's start to figure out who they are so we could start to identify the code and identify where we can find more of them. So when you start to understand them, you understand what their pains are, their goals, their frustrations, their challenges, what they're passionate about. Really become a student of that A-level client. And then you can attract more of them. And as I said before, create that feedback loop where an A-level prospect, because they're such a great fit and you identify that early on, you say, wow, this is an A-level. I'm going to go after them hard. I'm going to make them a customer and ultimately convert them into more of a client. And from there, they're going to be in a position to lead me to other A-level relationships. And you've got this great feedback loop. So there's tremendous power in focusing and orienting your brand and being that beacon to A-level relationships. And this is an example of a, of a, of a client that really understood their A-level relationships. How many times have you been in a in a network gathering where, where you've heard the, the financial advisor say, well, we work with high net worth individuals, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, yeah, I've heard that about a million times. This company is not about high net worth. They are, but that's not what they talk about. They talk about a richer life, Murphy Capital to a richer life. So do they deal with affluent people? Absolutely. But really their clients want a richer life. And that's not about money. That's about richness and experience, richness in family, richness in all the things that they can do with their wealth and all that their wealth affords them and all the things that they can go and the places they can go. It's about a rich experience and a richer life. And that's what they're all about. And this brand position helped propel them to great growth and eventually they were acquired by a larger fish. So when you understand your A, we often say you understand your brand and you can do great things. You can empathize with them, you can align with their needs and ultimately do what you really want to do from a branding standpoint and be a beacon. So other A's can see you and say, yeah, yeah, we want that too. And that's what you want to have with A's. Also important to understand yourselves. So a little bit of a self-diagnostic. Um, and we do a, a fairly detailed, I'm not going to go through it today, um, internal discovery process too, to really understand the DNA uh, internally. Because ultimately, a true and authentic brand is born from within. Because if you're people and you don't believe in it, it's going to be hard to, to get others to believe in it. So we use, um, Jim Collins called it the hedgehog. I call it the zone. What's your zone? What is that intersection of what you're best in class at, most passionate about, and also most profitable? So if you take Delia Associates, obviously it's brand development. It's more specifically, business to business brand development. That's what we're awesome at. We're passionate about it, and we're going to be profitable at that because we're really good at it. Here's another client, um, the Gillespie Group. Their message, we make for, for floors perform. Now, when we first came to Gillespie Group, they worked on commercial flooring and large commercial flooring, but they also worked on small flooring projects. They also actually had a residential division. So they were kind of all over the map. So we said, wait a minute, guys. What you seem to kill it at are these large, complex flooring projects where the floor is mission critical, hence the branding message, we make floors perform. We want that floor to really perform there's usually very exact or complex specs, and there's usually a tight timeline. Guys, that's what you're best at. Focus on that. A few years later, they went from one facility in New Jersey to New Jersey, then Pennsylvania. Now, fast forward, seven or eight locations across the country. Nationwide flooring co co contractor now, because they focused in their zone. They said, you know what? We're awesome at large, complex flooring projects. That's what we're going to focus on. And that's what they did. So moving on to competition, um, it's always important to look at the competition. And not necessarily to say, oh, you know, talking down on them, here's all the things they're doing wrong. What are they doing right? What are they saying? What's the first impression? If you go to a competitor's website, what do you see? What is that experience? And what does it mean to you? What are they doing and saying? And what are they not doing and saying? We learn a lot from evaluating and scoring the competition. And it tells us how we can truly compete, right? How we can best them or go places they're not going. So I'm going to give you a, just a little scenario about how this applies from a, from a color standpoint. So this was the competitive landscape for a, um, a vision uh, insurance client called Block Vision. And if you look at this color spectrum, you see lots of greens and blues, don't you? And shockingly, here was Block Vision, our client's color before we started with them. But a green blue, kind of just like everybody else. So we said, okay, well, we want to differentiate. So maybe one color we didn't see in the mix was 
yellow orange. And there were a lot of good reasons why we picked that color. So now let's look at yellow orange for block. Now we start to separate in the spectrum, in the competitive spectrum using color. And you know what? We can make the OC mean something more than just being that, that cool little eyeglass um, insignia. The OC now becomes our commitment to our customers with optimum care. So now it's an internal and external call to action. So we've aligned brand meaning in the mark itself and the color. And this is how their spectrum looked when we were done. Dramatically different, dramatically stepped out, totally distinct in the category. Nobody was using a color like this in that category before block vision. So this is just one example of looking at the competition to say, how can we use color? Now there's other ways to compete. You can compete on position, you can compete on, um, on the way you position your products, product selection. But in this case, we used color to set ourselves apart and it worked very well. Pretty good so far? Cool. Good stuff. All right. So moving on to defining, as I mentioned before, that awesome A level. Um, going through the target persona exercise is a great exercise to do because it humanizes. And Dan, you brought that up early on about that person, the person. This is a great way to really humanize that target audience. Because at the end of the day, I think sometimes, especially B2B brands do this, they think about their audiences as companies and objects, but they don't really think of them as people. When the rubber meets the road or where the rubber meets the road, it's down people talking to people. So really understanding and, and really just assigning a name and a classification and a, and a persona around who that target is, is really helpful in making your brand messaging far more human, far more emotive and far more targeted. So this is a great exercise. And as I said, I'm gonna provide you the deck and you can go through this. So Tarpy Group um, uh, Insurance and, and Employee Benefits and HR Services, um, in going through this exercise, we know we were targeting HR directors at non-for-profits that were incredibly stressed because they usually were time-strapped, resource-strapped, and didn't know all the latest protocols that they needed to know about um, HR compliance and best practices. So Tarpy Group, peace of mind insured, you know, that zenful feeling, that's how we want how, how we want their clients to feel. And it resonated with that audience because we knew their audience was very stressed out, very worried, and always kind of running in 10 directions. So by saying, hey, you're going to have this zenful peace of mind with Tarpy, it resonated. Um, value proposition is a great exercise to go through to really understand how you're deli delivering that uniqueness to that A-level persona. So, and this is just a basic um, um, exercise for, for developing a value proposition, especially for which is the who, who you're serving, who that A-level audience is, the brand is, what you do for them, and then that is the how, the unique recipe. Sometimes we call it the secret sauce, but it's that unique recipe, how you deliver uniquely, getting back to that zone, how you are best in class and, and, and how you deliver in a best in class way, um, in a way that you're passionate about. And this is an example for Fenton Construction. So they're a commercial contractor, especially for religious congregations, private ed and sports and rec facilities in New Jersey, Eastern PA and Southern New York. Fenton is the commercial construction company that provides total construction services with a unique combination of honesty, integrity, value, and superior attention to detail. Honesty, integrity, value, and superior attention to detail. We also call that the four corners of Fenton's solution set. It's that honesty, integrity, value, and superior attention to detail. That's what they're all about. That's their unique recipe. And their message, building with a higher purpose. Because if you think back to the religious and, and uh, facilities and sports and rec um, and education facilities. Again, that's all piece of places where people congregate to do what? To do something better, to make themselves better for a higher purpose. So the way it messaged out was, we build schools that go beyond client expectations that realize the dreams of everyone who walks through their doors, Fenton building with a higher purpose. Now we see the little, the little carrot in the logo. We use that to signify uh, wherever we could going higher, higher purpose. It may not surprise you to know that um, this is a faith-based organization. Um, so it would not be uncommon to, to show up on a certain day and see the executive team of Fenton gathered in prayer. So they are a faith-based organization. So that also resonated with them and was true to their culture. Um, they do so, and it's a very, it's, it's, it's very nice the way they do it. It's, it's not, some, you know, it's not in a heavy-handed way, 
or an overt way. It's a very casual way. So, um, um, they, but it, but it's definitely part of, of their value set. And um, and that was their uh, the way that they they articulated higher purpose. Connecting idea is another exercise we use to create the bridge with the brand in that ideal A-level persona. And to show you this exercise, uh, I'm just gonna take you through a little pieces of it is uh, Minilex. Minilex is a manufacturer. They make custom miniature extrusions, custom miniature aluminum extrusions. So this is the brand, brand client connection um, exercise. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this to you as part of the deck, but basically on one side, we're understanding the brand and what the emotion and that, that enables the relationship, the, the, what that relationship should be and what's, what's important. Who's the key connection group? What are they thinking? How would we like their thinking to evolve? And ultimately the RTBs are the reasons to believe. What's gonna help evolve that thinking? And in the center, we wanna use all this information and drive to the center that single most important thought that's gonna build a relationship with the brand. We often tell our clients, if you're working with a prospect and you get them to think this central thought, you're probably gonna win their business. Because if you can plant that thought in their head, they're gonna go with you. And for Minilex, we can trust Minilex for the exact products and responsive attention we need. Trust for the exact products and responsive attention. The emotion to enable the relationship is confidence. We can trust them, we're confident in them. The, the relationship should be an understanding, caring partner, collaborator, and friend, right? You trust a friend, you trust a partner, you trust somebody you collaborate with. And we wanna make sure that they, their thinking evolves to know that middle X will extrude low volume, tight tolerance, small complex shapes where others will not. Where others will say, we can't go there, middle X will go there. So we can trust middle X for the exact products and responsive attention we need. So from that, we were able to establish the messaging, middle X manufacturing precision partnerships. Again, those words coming right out of that uh, connection statement, precision partnerships, because you want more than a part, you want a partner, Minilex, manufacturing precision partnerships. And this is the way it laddered out to creative, web and digital, again, all about making precision partnerships. Uh, an important point about Minilex is that uh, true to their brand message, once they establish a relationship, they keep it for a really long time. So one of the most important data sets that we look at um, is new client starts. And we were able to increase new client starts last year, I think by 36%. So they were very excited because every time we get a new client start, we know we're, we're gonna keep that client for them for a really long time or until that part expires or is obsolete or they go out of business, we're gonna keep, they're gonna keep making that part for a real long time. So new client starts and starting those new relationships is always very important to them. So we talked about discovering, defining, let's talk about how we differentiate. And um, if you've not read uh, Purple Cow by Seth Godin, I know it's been out there for a while. Um, I actually met Seth Godin when he was first uh, putting that book out. Um, very unique individual, Seth Godin, as are many of the people that write uh, really good marketing books, but um, very, very, but he writes a good book. And, you know, the saying is every, every brand is remarkable, but what's remarkable about your, what's the remarkability of your brand? Why would people take note of it? Why would people talk about it and remark about it? And we enunciate remarkability through messaging and visuals. So this is a tool we use just to build out messaging in a very textbook formal way. And I just wanted to share that with you. So from the descriptor, which I taught, as we talked about before was the functional statement of what the brand does down to the brand statement, which is that call to action key messages which support that brand statement, supporting messages which enunciate further the key messages and then supporting content and content topics, it all letters down and it should all connect back to the core brand message and the core descriptor in some way. And that's really being brand aligned and celebrating your remarkability as a brand across the entire spectrum of content communications. So I'm gonna use Block Vision again, just to, to ladder that out in kind of a textbook way. Their brand statement, here's looking at you, their descriptor is comprehensive vision benefits. One of their key messages, we focus on you so you can focus on life. The supporting message is fast, easy, always available access to the info you need. The way we support that in content is highly experienced reps, an advanced provider search, which they had just launched at the time, 24 seven assistance, a member portal, which they also launched, multilingual and hearing impaired uh, able. And then the content topics ladder out from there. So this is a very kind of formalized way 
to build a messaging infrastructure that's totally brand aligned, but says all the things you need to say and make sure you're maintaining that remarkability at every step down the content chain. Making sense? Absolutely. Okay, cool. So from a visual standpoint, um, differentiating visually too. So this was four quarters, it's a relatively new client. They're a commercial HVAC um, client. And much like Block Vision in their category, everybody's using red and blue, mostly red, but red and blue. And here they were using red and mostly red, a little bit of blue. So we reposition them this way, new logo mark, more of a blue green color scheme, which was totally distinct in their market. Peace of mind on schedule was their message. And before the four quarters were just a stack of four coins. So we brought, pulled them apart and said, these are the four quarter stones of satisfaction, integrity, performance, quality, and value. So again, giving meaning to the mark, elevating their brand identity system and their website. And this is a company that did big projects. Like they're, they're, you see a helicopter in that scene. They actually do helicopter lifts to get their equipment on roofs. They're, they're, they're big HVAC. They're, they, they're, they, they work on some of the largest facilities in, in the greater region. And presentation. So that's how we're using visuals to create that remarkability. So now the logo means something. Visually, they're distinct. The trucks are all gonna be wrapped with that logo mark and that color scheme, and they're gonna look totally different in the category. We often talk about the words and images we use to create that remarkability. And another exercise we go through is we call it the brand in the hand. So we use words and images to one, establish awareness, and then we use through our content um, platform understanding and, and then establish distinction to ultimately create relevance and then to get to the, the fifth point or the thumb preference. And that's where we want to be. We're always driving from awareness, understanding, distinction to relevance and ultimately to preference in the eyes of our target market. Again, not everybody, but that A-level target persona. So that's a little bit on the uh, on, on AIM and discover, define, differentiate. Any questions at this point before we get into the last session? Good, okay. So when we get to tactics, I wanted to give you just a couple of exercises and thoughts. Um, there's only three ways that I know of to grow a B2B organization. You either get more customers, you get the ones you have to spend more, or you find ways to increase their buying frequency. And those are the only three ways to grow that I know of. So again, thinking back in terms of how you're assessing the marketing initiatives to take, how will it get a new customer? How will it get a, an existing customer to do more? Or how will it create an increased buying frequency with an existing relationship? And there's a, there's a journey to making that happen. And Dan, you may have a similar model, but this is our, that we use uh, this customer value journey. It was um, derived from um, a digital marketer did a similar one, but it was a little bit more complex. So we've, we've simplified it for the B2B world. Um, but it starts with awareness and goes to advocate. And a lot of CEOs I talk with, they wanna go right to advocate. They want people to, just be, to have raving fans, but you have to take clients through this journey and prospects through this journey to get to raving fan. So first they have to be aware. They have to know that you exist. And from there, you have to have ways to engage with them, to interact with them, to ultimately then convert them to some action, right? And from that conversion, an initial experience where you have to excite them and with what we call transformational value. They have to have a great experience on that first engagement. If you ever have want the chance of ascending to upselling them or selling them more services, or again, increasing their buying frequency. And then, and only then, do they become an advocate where they're willing to tell others about all the great things you can do. So aware, engage, convert, excite, ascend, advocate. This is the journey. And this is the journey that every brand has to take to get to that raving fan level. And if you think about your own clients, you probably have the different, there are different stages in this journey. And one of the roles of marketing, at least in the B2B spaces, how do we bridge? How do we get somebody from engage to convert and from convert to excite and so on? Always looking for ways to bridge the journey and make the journey more efficient. And again, as I said at the beginning, to hurry slowly across the path. 
So as I said before, there's three ways to grow. We've, um, we've mapped out 45 tactical ways to support these three ways. So, uh, and we've laid them out here. And again, I'm gonna share this with you, but there's 20 ways that we know of to get new customers. Lead magnets, interactions and quizzes, social advertising, 3D gifting, social messaging, catalogs, trade shows, you name it. These are the ways, the tactics to get more customers. There's 13 ways to get existing customers to do more. And these are some of the ways. And then there's 12 ways to increase that buying frequency um, to get them to do, do more on a frequent level. And that could mean different things to different companies. That might mean a subscription. That might be a, um, a long-term buying agreement that looks you know, a bunch of different ways, but there's, there's many ways to increase the buying frequency. So this is some guidance in terms of which tactics are right for my business. It's, well, what are you trying to do? If you're trying to get more new customers, that's where you focus. And again, making sure that you're connecting the dots to that core brand message and then hurry slowly and execute. So I'll leave you with one final case study, d and &E Consulting. Um, d and &E started with from very humble beginnings. Uh, the d and &E st stands for Donna and Ed. So it was a husband wife team that started the business as a small consulting practice in the uh, human resource um, um, capital management. So they provided software solutions to, um, to, to HR departments. Um, when we first came to them, um, they were their, their, their previous mark was on, on the left and they were almost em embarrassed of, of their, their brand and brand messaging. Um, we introduced a new logo and a new brand line here so you could do more to empower them and to allow them because they were starting to grow. It was beyond the Dawn and Ed show. It was now, they had a staff, they had about 15 people. Now I think they're up to like 50 or 60 people, but um, um, they had gone beyond and, and they really had hit that inflection point where we have to brand better. So this is how their new mark and messaging looked. And we used the plus sign as an active. So again, that remarkability was the plus sign. So that, and that stood for more. So everything that they do from a brand standpoint, there's some plus sign that's, that's integrated in and it's integrated into their logo as well. And this is how it played out in digital and then in um, um, email marketing and, uh, and, and print. And even their unique process, we branded as the performance plus process. Again, bringing that plus sign into the mix and integrated it into their entire mix. And then they debuted at their first trade show. This was their trade show booth as we were setting it up. And uh, to dramatic success, over 500 quality leads from that debut. And that took them to a whole nother level of their business. So that's just an example of um, using, using some of the ways to drive the brand forward. So summing it up, we talked a little bit about the terms, how a brand's constructed and why we should care about brand. We talked a little bit about getting, getting ready and aim, discover, define and differentiating and then deploy three ways to grow the customer value journey and, and some growth tactics that are align, aligned with those ways to grow to help you understand how to channel your marketing efforts for maximum effectiveness knowing that you can't do all 45 most likely, but helping you pick the ones that are most relevant to your business. And leave you with a quote from Albert Einstein, you never fail until you stop trying. So um, this is iterative, this is not easy. So um, it's okay to fail, just keep trying. And again, if you hurry slowly and you stay on the path and you focus with intent, you will get to where you wanna go, I promise you that. With that, I say thank you. And as a heads up, uh, if you go to delianet.com slash bizhack, you'll be able to download um, the, the full presentation. Thank you, any uh, questions? You know, Ed, thank you so much. This has been a fabulous presentation. And I guess my one big question for you is, how have you and how has your, um, how have your clients had to adapt some of these tactics um, because of COVID. Like for instance, uh, a lot of the, the big unveilings were at trade shows, like that construction company that doubled mm -hmm. its leads and you don't have that uh, available to you. So I'm, I'm curious how, uh, how that's impacted um, so, some of your clients and, and the way they approach the, the work that you do with them. That's a great question. So a lot of, um, a lot of our work is digital, but a lot more went to digital. And whereas there were, um, let's say if a client had a, had a heavy uh, trade show schedule, 
Um, we were helping a lot of clients redirect those to webinars and other interactions like live interactions, um, such as webinars, as well as um, helping them up their social media game. And some of them were a little bit lacking in that uh, department. So we saw a massive uptick in the usage um, and interaction on LinkedIn. So we were running a lot of LinkedIn messaging campaigns for clients and other uh, LinkedIn advertising and linking them back to um, webinars and other um, virtual but interactive experiences. So that's where a lot of that activity went. And um, lo and behold, a, a lot of our clients had um, great success with, with doing that and those experiences. And some of them said, gosh, this is a lot easier than getting 20 people to uh, Atlanta, you know, for a, a trade show and, and all the, the logistics and expense of that. So my guess is when uh, and as this pandemic subsides, we'll probably yeah. see something of a hybrid. Of, of People will go back to events. I, I, I can assure you of that because uh, we like to congregate as humans and be together. However, I think uh, we're going to see a lot, a lot of these webinars and, and virtual experiences um, sticking around and evolving. Absolutely. And uh, we'll, we'll close with, um, you know, Ross Can asked a, a, a great question, which is when you create kind of a quote, perfect brand program, how do you stay connected with your clients when your work, since your work is done? How do, how do we stay connected with our clients? No, like you, you work with one of your companies and you create this perfect brand. Yeah. Um, and which of course there's no such thing as a perfect brand, but you, you create a perfect brand. Then how do you then uh, emanate that into the, into the, into the world is what Ross is asking. Like it's, it's obviously not enough to create the brand. That's the foundation, but you still need to be in com constant conversation, moving people along that customer journey. Yes, yes. So um, when we're done with the brand development, then we go into the deploy, which is foundation and execution of the brand. And that continues to evolve. So we're always looking to be stewards of the brand message and the brand identity and looking for all the ways that we can evolve it and enrich it and entrench it in the markets that our clients uh, serve. So that's, a, that's an evolving. And then sometimes clients that we've worked with for a long time will reach a new inflection point where circumstances have changed and the previously established brand message and brand foundation need to evolve. Yeah. And we'll help them through that process too. And that usually is a good problem to have because that means that they've arrived to another level of growth or success in their respective market. Yeah. You know, I am so averse to the word perfect in the context of marketing. There's just really no such thing. Um, you know, uh, the work that, um, that you're doing, uh, Ed, is, is beautiful, um, but it's also evolving um, and it's constantly changing and shifting and improving uh, as the brand itself and the, and the marketplace evolves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it, always, it always will because um, our clients aren't standing in place and their competition and the market that they serve is not standing in place. So we're always evolving and we're always learning and we're always discovering uh, new ways, but a lot of the um, foundational um, thinking and tenets of brand and brand development um, have remained lar largely unchanged. Uh, what changes is, is usually the, the delivery mechanisms. They change and evolve. Um, uh, before my dad passed, we had a conversation uh, and we were talking about um, the evolution of the industry. And he said, he said, you know, I don't know that I would really like the style of the work today if I was still in the business. Um, and what, we, what he was referring to was the, the digital aspects because um, my father was a bit of a show person. He was an awesome dude, person to person, um, great presenter, great, uh, great guy to, to be around, like to have fun and really made the magic happen person to person as did a lot of his clients. And he understood that era very well. Um, and I'm yeah. not saying that, you know, that that's a bygone era. Um, in fact, a lot of people think um, when we talk about a, a, a demographic millennials, they think, well, millennials are all digital and they're just teched out and they don't like to talk to humans. That's not true. When they do a lot of their homework, they do far more homework at the front end than the previous, than my generation, Gen X, or even the boomers. But when they're good and ready, they will absolutely pick up that telephone and talk to a person and they have no problem with that. And that's a bit of a, a misconception about that um, demographic and studies have shown that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, if you don't mind uh, unsharing your screen, just so I can quickly sure. run through a couple. Um, yeah, in fact, only about um, one third of millennials fit into what we would call our stereotype of the kind of tech forward hip annual. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, the a lot of millennials. Um, oops, and it looks like my video has stopped. Let me. So let me uh, quickly. I'll share my screen. Um, just as a quick note, uh, BizHack recently refreshed its logo uh, from our uh, to add a little bit more of that Amazon orange, that kind of pop. And we did that because the the purple uh, and the blue tones uh, weren't popping quite as much on the screen, which is where we transitioned a lot. And so, uh, as you can see with Lilia's uh, screen, it's given us a lot uh, more uh, to play with as well as a, as a company. And we use specifically the orange that Amazon discovered is the highest converting color. Uh, and they have a, something called the Bob or the big orange button. So there's even a little bit of a digital marketing story behind the orange. <laughs> Purple, uh, on the other hand, is my favorite color. Uh, and, and sort of like, uh, you know, if you run your business, you might as well use the color you love. It's also a royal color and a color that's just very meaningful to me. I remember when my daughter she was four years old and she was uh, in Montessori school, preschool, and she was saying, hey, daddy, what's your favorite color? And I had to like dig back into my memory bank to remember what my favorite color was. And so uh, it's, um, uh, it, it was a really nice kind of daddy moment that, that uh, uh, was part of what inspired orange, uh, purple. I just color. Wanna, thank you. I just wanna let you all know, um, we are now uh, participating in uh, a B2B training grants specifically related to companies uh, 10 or larger. Uh, based in Florida or the five boroughs of New York. So if you fit into that category, please reach out to us. Uh, we do have some grant funding available for workforce uh, training. Um, I did also want to share that uh, next week, uh, I'm going to be presenting the lead building system. Would love, Ed, for you to come back or send somebody. This is our approach to lead generation and how we um, have, uh, after working with 700 businesses, basically take Ed's beautiful uh brand uh, and story and then put it out into the world to attract new customers to sell to strangers. The week after that, we're going to be talking about LinkedIn, another big B2B topic. It's become a much more important channel in the last year. It's probably among all the marketing we've seen, LinkedIn has really grown uh, in importance. It's been a transformative moment. And that, the fact that they're owned by Microsoft, uh, the software uh, and performance has gotten a lot better as well. Uh, invite for you guys to uh, support BizHack uh, and continue allowing this to be a community service throughout uh, 2021 uh, through the season pass. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Ed, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all. And have a great uh, rest of the day. Great being with you. Bye, everybody. Take care.